We advocate free speech because it is pragmatically observed to be a good way of doing things. Good ideas tend to resonate more than bad ones, and hence our civilization benefits from everyone being able to speak freely. Hate speech is a subcategory of free speech. Typically it is intentionally offensive, based almost solely on personal opinion, and designed to rally one population at the expense of another. The problem is that virtually all opinions fielded about society from the most banal comment on public spending to the most vile comment from a white supremacist. Come on, man. God bless America. It's like, hey, Hitler was God. Adolf Hitler was God. Would fall somewhat into this category. And so the very act of judging if language counts as hate speech is subjective. Who is it offensive to? You cannot judge it by its mm, unoffensive nature to a majority, else a racial slur against a minority would not really be an issue. You cannot judge it simply because it's exceptionally offensive to a minority, else even the most meek criticism of Islam or Scientology would be banned. I mean, I think it's typical of uh, Islamic schools and uh, the political Islamic movement to label any, any criticism a sort of prejudice and thereby racism, thereby trying to uh, make people uh, silent, uh, silent on criticizing it. The whole concept breaks down as being fundamentally unworkable. You simply have to grow thicker skin, and when you hear a shallow and baseless argument fielded to sow hate, put forward the suitable counter-argument. This is how free speech works. In this sense, you have to accept that free speech extends as far as the most transparent of hate mongers, such as Fred Phelps and white Christian Nazis. God hates Australia, land of the sodomite damned. The fag infested land of Australia is burning. The fire of God's wrath is sending hundreds of those filthy Australian beasts straight to hell. We at Westboro Baptist Church are rejoicing, and we are praying for the dear Lord to burn many more Australians alive. I was dismayed this week when I saw a satire of Fred Phelps's hate-mongering, made by Theta Omega, was removed by YouTube, even though the original remained available. God hates Westboro Baptist Church, church of the Sodomite Dam. The fire of God's wrath is sending fag-infested Westboro Baptist Church straight to hell. It seems difficult to reconcile that the vile ramblings of Fred Phelps count as free speech while a, a satire of that same rant does not. But free speech does have its limits. They are typically when the action being incited involves breaking the law, the most flagrant transgressions of which are usually by the Muslims. If you are using your free speech to incite the killing of others, then your actions are criminal in a modern Western civilization. But how to deal with such folk in a cost-effective fashion, especially when they constitute 10% of the population, as the Muslims do in several European countries? Jail is, of course, a very expensive way of doing things, as prisons typically cost $60,000 per year per person. It seems evident that such people are unhappy with Western values, such as free speech, and would indeed be far happier living in a religious theocracy such as Saudi Arabia. 
Before we well, keep coming down this apostasy, well, give, 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 give us a quick if, answer if, on if what is the penalty for apostasy. Then we we'll come country, to you very well know, if it's an Islamic country, then the Sharia is very clear. Apostasy, apostasy is dealt with the death penalty. Thank you. That's all I want to hear. It would seem pragmatic and cost-effective to offer to fly these people to a religious theocracy of their choice, first class of course, and pay for their nationalization there. In this sense, everyone is a winner. Lastly on the subject of free speech, there has been outrage recently from many Western countries about the UN proposing a resolution to make hate speech against religions criminal. Well, my first response was simply to chuckle. If the UN cannot stop genocide, how effective do you think they will be trying to enforce such resolutions? But while the legislation is unenforceable, for the reasons I stated earlier, this really isn't the point. The people who get most litigious about their religious persecution are Muslims and Scientologists. Sorry boys, you fail. Free speech is a founding pillar of our society, and it includes the right to call religious nutters on their psychotic beliefs. However, I am saddened by the latest act of the UN, as this is ultimately a body that we will probably need. We all breathe in the same air and live under the same atmosphere. We are all rats in the same cage, and sooner or later we will have to deal with that. Particularly in the US, there is a phobia about being subservient to the UN or any other organization in any way at all. The irony being is that what's being proposed is actually little different than an extension of the principle of the United States. The United States. Each of the states mostly has its own rules and regulations. But there are some broad, overarching general principles agreed to by all of the states to which they are subservient to the federal government for. This is also largely the mechanism by which the European Union has grown, and it is likely that sooner or later we will need a global organization of the nature of the UN for issues such as climate regulation and pandemic control. Issues that are larger than any nation. The UN needs to shape up in order to be fit for purpose. This requires those we have as functionaries in these organisations to fight for a bigger picture and not get drawn into disruptive, hen-pecking squabbles over national advancement. And we need them to be hard on those who attempt to subvert what is potentially a very useful global instrument for something as petty as the protection of some fragile Bronze Age desert myth. Finally, YouTube. We provide the media and the traffic, and they provide the service and earn the profit. However, for those of us who have been here a while, it feels progressively like playing a slow game of Russian roulette with a semi-automatic filled with the ambiguous bullets of the terms of service while walking through a gunnery range of big corporations such as Viacom and Warner Music Group sending over giant and somewhat random copyright shells with the tacit, if not full, consent of YouTube. The longer you play the game, the less YouTube's offer of an extensive and free service has appeal, simply due to the inevitability of the insta ban slash insta death option. You know, sooner or later, something's going to get you, unless, of course, you're just putting out some puerile catty gossip about some pop star's new haircut or or you're just some pointless banal teenager giggling for the camera. This week I saw another user with the in your face, if somewhat amusing name of Coctopus, get suspended. I don't remember too much about him other than he supported me in my hour of need. Apparently no warning was given. I have seen many accounts succumb to flagging campaigns of one sort or another, or some minor transgression offending the sensitive sensibilities of a moderator. Few ever return from their suspended status. <laughs>